As someone who's just as interested in how movies are made as I am in the final movie, I think it's important for people who love cinema to know that creative control over your own work is a big problem for a lot of filmmakers. Unlike most other forms of art, film can, in under close to no circumstances, not be made alone, and even less likely to be made without some amount of money. That money has got to come from somewhere, and most times it's not even all from the same place. So now as filmmakers, you have the money needed to make your vision come true, but you can't forget that more often than not, whoever is giving you the money is expecting something in return. Very rarely is a filmmaker, at least in a studio setting, given complete creative control over their project. A producer most of the time isn't giving money because they want to help you bring your vision to life. They want a return on their investment. And if you're someone who likes taking risks, they could force you to make the movie they want to make instead because it's more likely to make them money. All of this is kind of the reason I have massive amounts of respect for filmmakers who were able to rise above their circumstances and make their own visions of something, free from the hands of external influence. And a perfect example of this is African American filmmaker Melvin Van Peebles. Born in Chicago in 1932, Melvin Van Peebles' childhood took place during World War II, growing up with his father, a tailor at the time. He graduated from Wesleyan with a BA in English Literature, but three years of military service prevented him from writing his first novel until he moved to San Francisco in his 20s. He worked as a grip man on the cable car system until one day a passenger told him he should be directing films. He had begun working on three concepts that he had visualized as features, but upon finishing them he realized that they only came out to be about 11 minutes long. About the production of his first three shorts, he had this to say. I could make a feature for $500. That was the cost of 90 minutes of film. I didn't know a thing about shooting a film 16 to 1 or 10 to 1 or none of that shit. Then I forgot you had to develop film. And I didn't know you needed a work print. All I can say is that after I did one thing, he would say, well, aren't you going to put sound on it? And I would go, oh shit. That's all I could say. Eventually, he managed to complete his first shorts, and he took them to Hollywood to try to find someone willing to hire him as a director. The United States was still dealing with Jim Crow and racial discrimination at the time, and frustrated with the lack of work, Melvin moved to the Netherlands to study astronomy. On the way, Van Peebles stopped in New York and met with Amos Vogel, who agreed to play some of his shorts in their rental catalog, a massive win for Van Peebles as Amos Vogel was the founder and curator of Cinema 16, a film society dedicated to preserving and presenting avant-garde, independent, and international films. While in the Netherlands, Melvin decided to add the Van to his name, officially naming himself Melvin Van Peebles. After not finding much success in the Netherlands, Amos Vogel, who had shown his short films to the founders of the Cinématique Française, had invited Van Peebles to France, where he would later move to and create one more short film. The next five years would be spent learning French and about cinema while working as a writer. He would work first as an investigative journalist, then as a columnist in an anti-authoritarian comedy journal, and finally as the editor-in-chief for the French edition of MAD. Yeah, that MAD. Thankfully, it only lasted for five editions, and he was promptly out of a job again, during which he wrote his first plays and his first album, two mediums that Melvin would explore more personally later in his career. Van Peebles also wrote novels in that time, and one of them he would turn into his debut feature, The Story of a Three-Day Pass. The Story of the Three-Day Pass follows an African-American soldier given a three-day pass while stationed in France, and his brief relationship with a white woman working in a nearby shop. The simple story deals heavily with racism in both American and European society, as well as the realities of a mixed-race relationship and how one partner views the other, and how society views them as a whole. The film premiered at the San Francisco International Film Festival, where it caught the attention of Hollywood producers. Columbia Pictures had been looking for a director for a spec script they received from writer Herman Rauker, called Watermelon Man, a movie about a racist car salesman who wakes up to find that he's somehow turned black. Producers at Columbia Pictures had been afraid to hire a black film director for a while, but had decided after watching the story of a three-day pass that Melvin Van Peebles was the man for the job. Melvin got a surprising amount of say over the final project and pushed back against what the original writer envisioned for the project. Under Van Peebles, the studio, who had previously thought hiring a white actor to shoot the majority of the movie in blackface was a good idea, decided to instead just hire a black actor and landed on Godfrey Cambridge, a prominent comedian at the time. 
Herman and Melvin would often clash on set due to creative differences, with Herman envisioning the movie to be a commentary on liberal society, seeming progressive but still holding racist ideologies, whereas Melvin wanted the movie to be more focused on black identity and power. One of their biggest conflicts was on the matter of the ending, with Herman wanting the movie to end with the character being white again and realizing it was all a nightmare, but Melvin wanting to end the movie with the man accepting he would be black forever. Between them and the studio, they agreed to shoot two versions of the ending and figure it out in the editing, but when it came time, Melvin revealed he had forgotten to shoot the dream version of the ending by accident. Despite all the problems behind the scenes, Watermelon Man would become a huge success and resulted in Columbia offering Van Peebles a three-picture deal, something he would turn down in favor of making his first independent feature. After his experiences working on Watermelon Man, Van Peebles was sure he needed complete creative control over his next project and started privately funding a budget that resulted in around $500,000. He didn't have the exact idea in his head yet, but his already released films both dealt with the effects of racism on black people. So while driving in the Mojave Desert, Melvin looked out into the sun and decided the film would be about a brother getting the man's foot out of his ass. He named the film Sweet Sweet Beck's Badass Song and decided he would write, direct, star, edit, compose the score, and be in charge of marketing for the film. The film was completed in 19 days with an unprofessional crew and cast, and it was pretty hectic on set. Due to the danger of making a feature film outside of a union, crew members were armed on sets, although this caused some people to mix up prop guns and real guns, a mistake that thankfully didn't kill anybody. Instead of hiring actors, Melvin worked out a deal where real members of the Hells Angels biker gang would film a scene in the movie. After a few members had gotten bored, they began to take out knives to convince Melvin to let them go home. The crew responded by pulling out rifles on them, and the gang members stayed to complete the scene. There was also no stuntman on set, meaning Melvin, who was playing the titular character of Sweetback, had to do all the stunts himself. One notable story that came out of this was in one scene where Sweetback had to throw himself off of a bridge, which had to be performed nine times. Another was that all the sex in the movie was unsimulated as well, so in his second injury, Melvin contracted gonorrhea during the filming of one of the scenes. He applied for workers' compensation as an onset injury and bought more film with the money he received. After 19 days of production, they wrapped and the movie was released shortly after. Sweet Sweetback's badass song took Melvin's previously established ideas of revolution and black identity and ran with it, taking these themes to extremes they hadn't been seen before. The movie follows a black male prostitute who is falsely accused of murder and chased by white police officers, and throughout the film, Sweetback helps and is helped by members of the Black Panther Party and sacrifices his chance of freedom in the end for a party member, because he recognizes that activism is the key to their future. The film ends with Sweetback escaping to Mexico and evading police capture, vowing to come back and pay them their dues. The film received mixed reviews critically, but was surprising to black viewers at the time who were expecting the black protagonists fighting against the system to die in the end. Huey P. Newton, founder of the Black Panther Party, enjoyed the film, stating it was the first truly revolutionary black film ever made, and making it require viewing to join the party. In the making of this film, Melvin Van Peebles wanted to communicate the political beliefs and experiences of the world that he couldn't before but he knew he had to portray them in an entertaining way or else it would never make any money. He was right in trying to make the movie more marketable because it ended up resonating with more people than expected and grossing $15 million. Spike Lee states, Sweet Sweetback's badass song gave us all the answers we needed. This was an example of how to make a film, distribute it yourself, and most importantly, get paid. Without Sweetback, who knows if there could have been a She's Gotta Have It, Hollywood Shuffle, or House Party. Melvin Van Peebles would continue working in Arch, producing a few Broadway plays, records, and movies after the success of Sweet Sweetback. In the 80s, he would take a step back from the art world and became a trader on the American Stock Exchange. He would make some public appearances here and there, and would sometimes put out an album, but since the 90s, he's lived the rest of his life in relative peace, staying at home with family until eventually passing away at home at the age of 89. Melvin's legacy continues to inspire filmmakers to this day, however, and it's no surprise why. From being rejected work in your home country, to moving to another country, learning the language, establishing yourself as a writer, only to finally get two opportunities to make movies under studios before finally being able to produce your own, 
unfiltered vision takes a lot of hard work and dedication, and the resulting film has no doubt inspired lots of filmmakers to go for their own vision. So I hope you've learned something from this look into the life of one of the people that has made that possible.